How are we doing? Good to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out and turn to the book of Acts. Uh, Acts is where we're going to be this morning, Acts chapter 2, kind of finishing up this little two-week series talking about uh, the mission of God and the mission of the church. And so uh, as you're looking for that, uh, think about the word boring, All right? Boring is just one of those words, like it sounds bad when you say it, boring. We, we don't want to be bored anywhere. It's one of those things that we dread in life. We don't want to be bored at work. We, we don't want to be bored uh, in, our, in our activities. We don't want to be bored when we play. Like pretty much we dread that in any circumstance of, of life is, is boredom. And Barna just did some research on church and he, he asked people who attend church, they asked people who attend church to describe their experience. And that's one of the words that was used. The bride of Christ. Boring. But Worse than that, because we're not really in the entertainment business anyway, are words like irrelevant. The bride of Christ, the church, is irrelevant or dead. You know what dead means, right? Without life. So, so the bride of Christ, Jesus said that he came that we might have life. And, and he gave us the church, his bride, to accomplish his mission and his purposes on this earth. And, and people are saying that the church is boring and dead and irrelevant. How sad. We talked about last week the mission of God. That, that God didn't create a mission for his church. He created the church to accomplish his mission. So the very tool, the very thing that God created to accomplish his mission on this earth is something that is boring and dead and irrelevant, that, that is actually a turnoff to people coming to faith in Christ. Barnard's research said that people were open to believing in God. They were open to spiritual things. They just didn't want to have anything to do with this church. And that's sad when you think about it. But there's hope. There's a blueprint that we see in Scripture. God's real good about that. In Acts chapter 2 uh, of the church, of a church that is alive of a church that is vibrant, of a church that is life-giving. And understand when I talk about the church, I'm not talking about a physical building. I'm not even talking about Mission City Church. The church is who? It's us, right? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are the church. And so when we talk about the mission of the church, if you're a follower of Christ, we're talking about you, your involvement in the mission and who God has called us to be. And so last week we talked about that. What does it, it look like to, to be specifically the people of God on mission? And this week I want us to talk and press in a little bit uh, and look at Mission City Church, right? A lot of times when I talk about the church, I'm talking about the big C, the New Testament church. And then there's the little C, which is the local faith family, the local church. One of the great things about our church uh, right now is so many people are new. Both of our campuses, so many people that are part of our church are new. A lot of you are still just kind of checking us out, seeing what you think. You, you come, you're not really engaged, you're involved yet, but you're, you're, you're liking it okay, right? But if you're going to be involved in something, if you're going to, to give your life to something, you need to understand what we're about and who we are and, and the mission of God. We have a mission here at Mission City Church. We have a mission statement. I know every organization likes to have a mission statement, but we actually pay attention to ours. This is the mission statement of Mission City Church. To engage people where they are with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to lead them in lives of transformation. And one of the reasons that, that I love our mission statement is because it's participatory. We are not a church that wants to exist to draw a crowd for people just to sit in the audience. We're engaging people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, participatory, one-on-one. -on -one. We're all involved in that. Leading people in the lives of transformation, that's discipleship, that's, that's helping people in that sanctification process. Again, that is participatory. It's something we're all involved in. So as we think about the mission of the church, we go to God's word, to Acts chapter 2, where's, where there's this example of a life-giving church, this picture of what the church is really supposed to be. So if you have your Bibles or your device, whatever you use to read God's Word, look in Acts chapter 2. We're going to pick up in verse 41. This is what it says. Uh, and give you a little background. This is the beginning of Acts. 
Jesus has just been resurrected. He has ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit, Pentecost, has taken place. Peter has just stood up. Chicken Peter that was scared of a little girl when Jesus was being arrested is now standing up in front of thousands and thousands of people and, and preaching the gospel. And it says that those who accepted his message, the message of the gospel that Peter was preaching, were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added to the church. That's a pretty good day, right? It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold their possessions, their property. They distributed the proceeds to all, and anyone that anyone had any need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty exciting. Doesn't sound boring. Doesn't sound irrelevant. It definitely doesn't sound dead. And we like to hold up this Acts chapter 2 as kind of the picture of how the church is supposed to be. And look at what God did 2,000 years ago. But here's the thing we need to understand. The same Holy Spirit that did that is the same Holy Spirit that we have today. And I believe with every fiber of my being that God's not done. I believe with everything inside of me that God wants to do that and accomplish that through his church today. And my prayer is that Mission City Church can be this type of church. God still wants to transform this world and his tool to carry out this mission has always been the church. Now think about this. There's a lot of great ministries out there outside of the church a lot of you support those ministries, you're involved in those ministries, maybe you even work at those ministries. And I encourage you to be involved and then support them and all of those things. But the reason that ministries exist outside of the church is because the church wasn't doing its job. See, his, his tool for accomplishing his purposes and his mission is the church. But we've fallen behind. We've gotten too preoccupied with entertaining preoccupied with building brands and, and having crowds and how do we look on social media versus being the church and who God has called us to be and, and the mission of God. And so when I think about Mission City Church, again, we're not the perfect church, we're not the only church, but you're the only church I pastor. Who has God called us to be? And what is God calling us to? So Mission City Church, which is you, what do we need to be? We need to be a church that's passionate about God's word. Look in verse 42. It says, and they read their Bibles most days. Is that what it says? No? What does it say? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. It didn't say, hey, we just we read our Bible sometimes. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Now, understand in Acts chapter 2, they didn't have the New Testament. The apostles were actually teaching these things. Like, it was coming out of their mouths what became our scriptures. They were devoted to that. Devotion means to, to love something, to be loyal to something. When I think about uh, devotion... I think about David and Linda May. David works in our tech booth and Linda helps with our communion, different things like that. David and Linda May are passionate about UTSA sports. Matter of fact, they were passionate about UTSA sports before it was cool. Before 210 and going to bowl games and all these things, they had a trailer at their house. They live in my neighborhood. They have a trailer at their house that has wrapped UTSA and has a roadrunner on the side of it. They, they were out there tailgating when nobody else was. They love, they're passionate about UTSA football. We're all bandwagoners, right? We're just getting on board now. They, they've been there. More than UTSA football, they're passionate about God's church. But it's something they love. It's something that they're loyal to. When we think about God's word in the church, God's word needs to be something that we love. Something that we're loyal to. A church that's going to be a church on mission is a church that focuses on God's work. Now, there's a lot of organizations that claim to be churches. 
A lot of people that stand up on Sunday mornings and give some great pep talks. Five ways to have a happy life. Three ways to improve your marriage. You ever notice it's always numbers, right? It's just always like that. And those are all good. We want you to be happy. We want your marriage to be awesome. But I have nothing of value, Matt Serber, to give to you. I'm just not that smart. The, the things that I would share with you, the principles, won't last. Matter of fact, if I gave you a great motivational speech this morning, and you're all fired up about, about God, and you pull out of this parking lot, and somebody cuts you off, and like five minutes before you're listening to a message, and you're like, you're giving them the holy one finger, right? Kind of deal. That, that's how far and how long motivational speaking lasts. God's word is transformative. If the word of God is not central, we're not a true fellowship of believers. We're just an organization. We're just a a group that's getting together. And if you look at the early church, the foundation of everything that they did was the word of God. God's word reveals the truth about who God is. It puts our focus and our attention on him. God has to be central to the message. Did you know, and I don't know how much time you spend in, in the Bible, do you know who the star of this book is? Let me give you a hint. It's not you. How many of you seen the new Top Gun? Raise your hand. It's a good movie, by the way. Who's the star of Top Gun? Uh, yeah, it's Tom Cruise, right? So let's just say that you had a friend that was like, you know what, I can get you in and you can be an extra in one of the scenes. And so you get in, and you're one of those scenes that, like, you can't even tell it's you, but you're in the movie. And it's like for the rest of your life thinking that Top Gun was about you and you were the star. This is about him. It puts our focus on him, and it takes our focus off of us. God has to be central to the message. So as you look at this, it says that there was fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer, and there's a biblical pattern that we see here for the church. In verse 41, it says that they accepted the message. In other words, Peter presented the gospel. People responded to the gospel, and they were saved. Then they were baptized. Baptism is your public profession of faith. It's you identifying with Christ. And then they were motivated. In the original language, it talks about that they were persistent, active listeners when it comes to the apostles' teaching. It wasn't just something that they heard for an hour once a week. Like, it was continuous and active. And then they focused on the message of the cross through the breaking of bread and communion. When we take the Lord's Supper, that's what it's all about. It's pointing people to the cross of Jesus Christ. And so if we're going to be on mission, if we're going to be the church that God calls us to be, We have to be passionate about the Word of God. But then we have to be a church that is together. You know, everybody likes to be part of a group. Everybody wants to have friends. Everybody wants to have fellowship. That's that's why we're in groups. That's why we're part of clubs. That's why when you were in high school and middle school growing up, you were in sports or in the band or in the chess club or whatever. It didn't matter. You just wanted to have a group. You wanted to have some, some friends. That's why people join gangs. They don't even care that it's illegal. At least I have a group that I'm a part of. How many of you think that you're an introvert? You don't even want to raise your hand. You're like, whatever. whatever. (laughs) You know, even introverts need fellowship and need community and need people. God created us because we're created in the image of God. And how does God exist? God exists in relationship. The Father, the Son the Holy Spirit. God created us to need, to desire community and fellowship, togetherness with other people. Look in verse 44. All the believers were together and had everything in common. So he's talking specifically about believers, followers of Jesus Christ. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Now let me be clear as you look at that. Church attendance is not community. Church attendance is just going someplace for an hour. Now, we're glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're here. I want you to be a part of what God's doing at Mission City Church. But if you're just checking a box, 
That's not togetherness. It's not community. You, you can come in, and I hate that this is the case, and this is true of any church. You can come in and not speak to anyone. You, you can sit in your chair and not speak to anyone around you. You can get up and leave when it's over and not speak to anyone, and no one even knows that you're here. That's not community. Community togetherness is, is being known. It, it's kind of like these jars that I know you've been looking at, especially because we're closer to lunchtime. I have two jars. Last night I, I went to Walmart, bought two jars. In this one, these are gumballs. Right? And, and these gumballs are interesting because even though uh, they're in the same place, right? They're in the same jar, they're not really together. Because there's a, there's a hardness on the outside of each gumball that, that kind of keeps you from getting to the good part. And so they're in the same jar, but they're not really together. Then you have the gummy bears. And for those of you that are health conscious, these are organic gummy bears. They're all kind of juicy in there, kind of squished in there together. Like there's really no form anymore to the bear. It used to be a bear. Now it's just like gobbledygook. They're together. The sweetness, the goodness is all kind of getting pressed in. You can't really tell hardly which one's which. If I tried to get one out, I probably couldn't just get one. Probably several would come out because they're just, they're, they're together. That's what God calls his church to. So many of us think we're a part of community, but we're the gumballs. We're in the same jar, but we're not really together. That hardness on the outside keeps us from really getting close. This is what God calls his church to be. True togetherness, true community, developing, encouraging godly relationships, a sense of responsibility for one another, that if there's needs, if there's things that are happening, we can rejoice together, we can be there for each other, we can encourage one another, we can challenge one another, that we're with a group of people that actually care. And what's so interesting is you look at the early church and this example that God gives us for community and togetherness, the people in the early church could not bear to have too much while others had too little. They gave of the resources and they gave it themselves. Now, some people look at that and they're like, you're promoting socialism, communism. We're supposed to go sell everything and give it all away. I don't even think that that's what was taking place. I think within the body, within community, when people had and someone didn't, there was a need, they met it. It's part of why when you think about your personal resources and finances that, that, that I talk about uh, having margin in your life. To have margin so if God says, hey, there's a need over here. I need you to meet that need that you're able to say yes. God, you've blessed me. I have. And so let me use that to meet this need over here. In community, when you're in community with other people and there's a need, there, there are people there that say, hey, let us step in. Let us help. And it's not just resources. It's not just finances. Sometimes it's just you being there. It, it's the, the 2 a.m. friend. Maybe you have some of those. It's the one person, if everything was falling apart in the middle of the night, you're like, I know that I could call them. And they would actually answer and actually be there for me. That, that's what he calls us to. Encouraging one another. Not just being together, but being together. To focus on the needs of others. And, and when there's fellowship, when, when we come together, there's unity. I love that about that togetherness. So many churches today have a lot of people, but they're not together. And that's why there's so much conflict within the church. We want to discuss and worry about everything else that doesn't matter. Over 60 times in the New Testament, the idea of unity or togetherness is spoken of. And when I talk about unity, I'm not talking about uniformity. That we all have to look alike and dress alike and act of life. All these Ned Flanders fill in the church. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the mission of God in our togetherness because we have relationship with each other. Even though we all have preferences and things that we like, the mission of God is more important. That's unity. That comes from togetherness. Now, here at Mission City Church, part of how this happens is life groups. 
It's a major emphasis of our church. It's something that's growing, uh, especially here at the Northwest Campus. Next week, you're going to have an opportunity. We're having something uh, called Connection Point. Where all of our life groups are going to have a, like a life group fair outside uh, of the worship center. An opportunity to, to connect with other people. If you're not involved in a life group, to, to be a part of a life group and find out about a life group. That's where togetherness happens. A church on mission is going to be a church that is together. But it's also a church that worships. Look in verse 46. Every day. They devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God. Now, one of the things you're going to notice as you look at that, when it talks about their worship, it wasn't just an hour a week. It does not say, and every Sunday for an hour, they got together, sang some songs, shook hands, and went to eat Mexican food. Now, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together, the temple complex, breaking bread together, right? And when you think about worship, God doesn't want from you in worship. God wants all of you in worship. God God wants your very lives in worship. When you think about worship, don't think about an hour a week. Don't think about 25 minutes on Sunday morning when you sing songs. Worship is you surrendering your life every day. Romans chapter 12. We're called to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Sacrifice is is surrendering yourself, surrendering something as an offering. So as followers of Christ, we surrender ourselves. We die to self. We take up our cross. We follow him every day. Worship is not an hour. Worship is not 25 minutes. Worship is seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Not my will. Father, but yours be done. And look at worship. Think about their worship compared to our worship. There was a sense of awe and and fear. Not that they were scared of God, just this, this holy fear of God's holiness and who he is. There was wonder. They were amazed by God's grace and God's salvation. There was, again, this togetherness, this commonality of Christ, which created this love for one another. All of these things were were evident in worship. And at the heart of corporate worship and individual worship is the celebration of God. That's what it's all about. That's why I just can't fathom sometimes when we have an opportunity to, to sing and worship that it's like, That's about how we're worshiping. And I'm not telling you to flip down the aisle. But if we think about worship and the reason we're here, the celebration of it, their worship was emotional. Why? Because of praising God. There was a a thankfulness for the supreme blessing that they had found in Jesus Christ. If for no other reason, we should be emotional and energetic in worship because we're just thinking about what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Overwhelmed by my thankfulness for the gospel, the presence of God is in corporate worship. That when we sing, when we gather together, when we open God's word, in this place right now, the presence of God is here. And you're like, I don't feel him. That's a you problem. Where two or more are gathered, I'll be there. I'm here. His Holy Spirit is here. This isn't a history lesson. This isn't talking about something that happened 2,000 years ago. This is what God wants to do today through our worship, being overwhelmed in worship. I was watching a couple weeks ago. There's a thing, I don't know, it's Netflix or something like that. It's called Behind the Music. Everybody, anybody ever watch Behind the Music? It's like 80s bands and stuff, so if you're old, you go back and watch it because those are, that's who you liked when you're like 17, 18 years old. And I was watching behind the music of New Kids on the Block. Remember New Kids on the Block? Whoa, whoa, whoa. There we go. So we're watching this, and New Kids on the Block was one of these things that like if you were a teenage girl, you loved New Kids on the Block. And if you were a teenage guy, you hated New Kids on the Block. Because all the girls love New Kids on the Block. And so you're watching this documentary and they have, you know, film and footage of, of back in the 80s and all this when they're, when they're performing. And there's these guys up on the stage, these teenage guys, and literally 40,000 13 to 18 year old girls. 
and they're zooming in on them like in the front row, and girls are crying and passing out because they are at a New Kids on the Block concert. Matter of fact, Donnie Wahlberg told a story. He's like, yeah, I was in a hotel, elevator. He's like, it was just crazy back then. The doors opened up. There were three teenage girls. They saw me in the elevator, and literally two of them fell out, just passed out. Emotional. Why? Because they're in the presence of new kids on the block. That's cheesy. Don't you think there should be a little bit of emotion when we have an opportunity to be in the presence of a holy God? Again, not just in the hour when we're here, in, in, in our lives. Our, our lives are worship. So they worship together. And then the church has to be purposeful about seeing lives transformed by the gospel. Look in the second part of verse 47. Having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. So they were purposeful. They were intentional. How they were living life together, honoring Christ, worshiping Him with their lives. It was appealing that that people from all around who were not Christ followers were looking at them and going, I don't know what's going on here, but what you have, I want. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And I love it says having favor with all the people. I know that we touched on this a little bit last week. But for whatever reason, especially in the United States, churches are the most homogeneous groups and gatherings of almost any place. It's like we just want to be around people that look like us. But the reality is true Christianity, a church that is truly on mission, honoring Christ, focusing on his word, worshiping together, doing life together, is appealing to all. Everything in our culture, because Satan's really good at this. He's a liar and a thief. He wants to steal, to kill, and destroy, right? Everything in our culture wants to divide us up socioeconomically, educationally, racially. You know what the great unifier is? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it doesn't matter if you're black. It doesn't matter if you're white. Doesn't matter if you're Hispanic, doesn't matter if you're Asian, doesn't matter if you're rich, doesn't matter if you're poor, doesn't matter if you're educated, doesn't matter if you're uneducated. The commonality, the thing that we all have that makes us family and draws us together is the gospel. Revelation says that one day when Jesus comes back for his bride for the church, every tribe and every tongue and every nation is going to be there. A church that is on mission will give us a little glimpse of what that's going to look like on earth. We want everyone to come to Mission City Church and feel like this can be their home. Not worried about, well, how am I dressed? Do I look good enough to be here? Do I drive a nice nice enough car? I don't see a lot of people whose skin looks like mine here. Am am I welcome here? It, It says all having favor with all the people. And listen, when that happens, God does what God does. It says the Lord added to their number daily who, those who are being saved. Like we, we, can, we can go out and be about the mission and tell people about Jesus, but ultimately, you know who does the work? God does. He does the work. The Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. And what's the result of all this? Transform lives. Transform lives. That's what we're about. But here's the deal. Transform lives starts with one. God using you. You coming to that place where you surrender your life, not only for salvation to Jesus Christ, but you surrender your will, you surrender your future, you surrender everything and say, God, I'm yours. I'm a a living act of worship for you. I offer my body as a living sacrifice. And guess what? When one person is transformed... Families can be transformed. And when families are transformed, cities can be transformed. And when cities are transformed, the world can be transformed. How big was Jesus' group when he first started out? Twelve. 
12 uneducated men in the Middle East, no internet, no airplanes, didn't even know that North America existed. Literally transformed the world. See, God is calling you to something greater. God is calling our church to something greater. Our goal is not to build up Mission City. Our goal is not to be a big church. Our goal is to be about the things that God has called us to. And he's calling you to something more. So the question is, are you going to join him in his mission? Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for, God, just this example you give us in Acts chapter 2 of the church and just these principles of what what a church on mission looks like. God, we want to be passionate about your word. We want to be together. We want to worship. God, we want to be purposeful. We want to see lives transformed. But God, even more than, than we desire that, you desire that. Again, you didn't create a mission for your church. You created a church for your mission. God, we want to be a part of your mission. And God, you are calling us to something more. Lord, for some of us, we would claim to be Christians and Christ followers. And our relationship with you, our involvement with you is something that's about convenience. If nothing else is going on, I'll give you a little bit of time. But we've never surrendered our lives to you. God, I pray that that Mission City Church would be a church full of people who have surrendered their lives to Jesus. God, whatever you want to do, whatever it takes, use us, transform us, God, to accomplish your mission. And Father, we know that even this morning, even here in this room, people watching on the internet, there are people that don't know Jesus. They don't have a relationship with him. It all starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. That God loved us so much that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have purpose, so that we could be complete in Christ Jesus. So I pray for anyone that doesn't know Jesus, today might be the day of salvation. And then for those who would claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, God, help us to surrender. God, you're calling us to something more. God, help us to be obedient to that today. God, we love you. We thank you for first loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for our online worship service. God is doing so many things at Mission City Church that we would love for you to be a part of. Go to missioncity.church and learn more. I also want to encourage you to worship through giving. Click the Give button at the top of your screen and be a part of our mission in that way as we continue to see God transform lives here in San Antonio and online. We'll see you next week.